everybody. Today I'm going to be reading some of my English reading. Um, I just thought maybe I should record this. Um, some of you might like this essay or also it'll help you put you to sleep. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Let me just position my mouse. Okay. All right. But there is also another sense in which seeing becomes before words. It is seeing which establishes our place in the surrounding world. We explain that words with words, but words can never undo the fact that we are surrounded by it. The relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. Even evening, we see the sunset. We know that the earth is turning away from it. Yet the knowledge, the explanation, never quite fits the sight. The surrealist painter Marguerite commented on this, always presenting the always present gap between words and seeing in a painting called The Key of Dreams. The way we see things is affected by what we know or what we believe. In the Middle Ages, when men believed in physical existence of hell, the sight of fire must have meant something different from what it means today. Nevertheless, their idea of hell owned a lot to the sight of fire consuming and ashes remaining as well as their experience of the pain of burns. When in love, the sight of the beloved has a completeness which no words and no embrace can match, a completeness which only the act of making love can temporarily accommodate. Yet the seeing which comes before words and can never be quite covered by them is not a question of mechanically reacting to stimuli. It can only be thought of in this way if one isolates a small part of the process which concerns the eyes right now. We only see what we look at. To look is an act of choice. As a result of this act, what we see is brought within our reach, though not necessarily within arm's reach. To touch something is to situate oneself in reaction to it. Close your eyes, move around the room, and notice how the faculty of touch is such a static, limiting form of sight. We never look at just one thing. We are always looking at the relation between things and ourselves. Our vision is continually active, continually moving, continually holding things in a circle around itself, constituting which is present to us as we are. Soon after we can see, we are aware that we can also be seen. The eye of the other combines with our eye to make it fully credible that we are part of a visible world. If we accept that we see that hill over there, we propose that the hill we can be seen, that from the hill we can be seen. The reciprocal nature of vision is more fundamental than that of spoken dialogue, and often dialogue is an attempt to verbalize this, an attempt to explain how, either metaphorically or literally, you see things, an attempt to discover how he sees things. In the sense in which we use the word in this book, all images are man-made. An image is a sight which has been recreated or reproduced. It is a reproduce. It is an appearance or a set of appearances which has been detached from the place and time in which it in which it first made its appearance and preserved for a few moments or a few centuries. Every image embodies a way of seeing, even a photograph. For photographs are not, as is often assumed, a mechanical record. Every time we look at a photograph, we are aware, however slightly, of the photographer is selecting that sight from an infinity of other possible sights. This is true even in the most casual family snapshot. The photographer's way of seeing is reflected in his choice of subject. The painter's way of seeing is recon reconstituted by the mark he makes on the canvas or paper. Yet, although every image embodies a way of seeing, our perception or appreciation of an image depends also upon our way of seeing. It may be, for example, that Sheila is one figure among twenty, but for our own reason she is the one we have eyes for. Images were first made to conjure up the appearances of something that, were, that was absent. Gradually, it becomes evident that an image could outlast what is represented then showed how something or some body had once looked, and thus by implication how the subject had once been seen by other people. Later, the specific vision of the image maker 
was also recognized as part of the record. An, Im an image becomes a record of how X has seen Y. This was the result of an increase in consciousness of individuality, accompanying an increasing awareness of history. It would be rash to try and date this last development precisely, but certainly in Europe such consciousness has existed since the beginning of the Renaissance. Oh, just a little too far. No other kind of relic or text from the past can offer such a direct testimony about the world which surrounded other people at other times. In this respect, images are more precise and richer than literature. To say this is not to deny the expressive or imaginative quality of art, treating it as mere documentary evidence. The more imaginative the work, the more profoundly allows us to share the artist's experience of the invisible. Yet when an image is presented as a work of art, the way people look at it is affected by a whole series of learned assumptions about art. Assumptions concerning beauty, truth, genius, civilization, form, status, and taste. Many of these assumptions no longer accord with the world as it is. The world as it is is more than pure objective fact. It includes consciousness. Out of the truth with the, presented, with the present, these assumptions obscure the past. They mystify rather than clarify. The past is never there waiting to be discovered, to be recognized for exactly what it is. History always constitutes the relation between a present and its past. Consequently, fear of the present leads to mystification of the past. The past is not for living in. It is a well of, con of conclusions from which we draw in order to act. Cultural mystification of the past entails a double loss. <clears throat> Works of art are made unnecessarily remote, and the past offers us fewer conclusions to complete an action. When we see a landscape, we situate ourselves in it. If we saw the art of the past, we would situate ourselves in history. When we are prevented from seeing it, we have been deprived of the history which belongs to us. Who benefits from this deprivation? In the end, the art of the past is being mystified because of privileged minorities striving to invent a history which can retrospectively justify the role of the ruling classes. Such as justification can no longer make sense in modern terms, and so inevitably, it mystifies. Let us consider a typical, typical example of such mystification. A two-volume study was recently published on Franz Halls. It is a third work to date on this, paint, on this painter. As a book of spe specialized art history, it, it is no better, no worse than the average. The last two great paintings by Franz Hals portray the governors and governesses of an alms house for an old paupers in Dutch 17th century city of Harlem. They were officially commissioned portraits. Hals, an old man of order eight, of over 80, was destitute. Most of his life he had been in debt. During the winter of 1664, the year he began painting these pictures, he obtained three loads of peat on public charity, otherwise he would have frozen to death. Those who now sat for him were administrators of such public charity. The author record records these facts and then explicitly says that it would be incorrect to read into paintings any criticism of the sitters. There is no evidence, he says, that Halls painted them in the spirit of bitterness. The author considers them, however, remarkable works of art and explains why. Here he writes other regentedness. I'm just going to skip that part. <laughs> the compositional unity of a painting contributes fundamentally to the power of its image. It is reasonable to consider a painting's composition, but here the composition is written about as though it was itself the emotional charge of the painting. Terms like harmonious fusion, unforgettable contrast, and reaching a peak of Breath and strength transfer the emotion provoked by the image from the plane of lived experience. To that of disinterested art appreciation, all conflict disappears. One is left with the unchanging human condition and the painting considered as marvelously made object. 
Very little is known about Halls or the Regents who commissioned him. It is not possible to produce circumstantial evidence to establish what their relatives, what their relations were. But there is evidence of the paintings themselves. The evidence of a group of men and a group of women is seen by another man, the painter. Study this evidence and judge for yourself. What is the seduction he writes of? It is nothing less than the paintings working upon us. They work upon us because we accept the way Hulls saw as sitters. We do not accept this innocently. We accept it at, in so far as it corresponds to our own opposition of people, gestures, faces, and institutions. It is possible because we live in a society of comparable social relations and moral values. It is precisely this which gives the painters their physiological and social urgency. It is this, not the painter's skill as a seducer, which convinces us that we can know the people we're trained. Okay, I'm going to end this reading right here since this is pretty long and I'm sure you guys don't want to sit through the whole thing. But thank you for watching. If you guys want me to read more of my English readings, I certainly can since I get a lot of them. Anyway, have a nice day. Uh, or sleep. <laughs> Good night, guys.